Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, The Evolution of Agile Portfolio Management for Scaled Agile Success. My name is Laurel Heenan, and I am delighted to be your moderator for this webinar. Jasper Sunnevelt is an executive consultant at LeanKit. Jasper's main focus is bringing effectiveness and responsiveness within the organization to do the right things using Agile and Lean principles. In his day-to-day -day operations, he is creative, energetic, assertive, confident, and competitive. He uses these quali qualities in training, workshops, and coaching to establish a supported change in organizations. Jasper is an active member of the Agile community and for the last year has also been active coaching organizations that apply Agile and Lean principles outside of IT. Trevor Bruner is a product manager at TaskTop. His varied background ranging from financial services, oil and gas, to U.S. Navy submarine officer has helped him manage all of the responsibilities inherent in building a valuable product. At TaskTop, he's enjoyed the opportunity to teach customers about the vast capabilities of TaskTop. Thank you very much. Uh, hello and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jasper uh, and I'll be taking you through this first part of the webinar today. Um, I'll talk about Agile portfolio management um, and we'll bring in a, as many of my own experiences as, as I can. Stuff I learned from organizations I've worked with um, and things I've learned in order to help you get your skills Agile success. So before we start, I'd like to start off with a poll first to get a little bit of an understanding of where you are in your uh, scaling project or in your agile transformation. So looking at these results, we got a, we got a good mix of experience here. Uh, not that many people that think they have achieved scaled agile. Um, that's too bad because there's usually somebody there who can actually teach this, do this presentation for me. Um, but it's uh, it's good to have such a nice mix. Uh, we're about yeah we're we're about uh, just begun or or in the middle with most of uh, most of the people attending. We have some people that are just starting to think about it. So what I what I would like to talk to you about today is is a little bit about agile portfolio management and the challenges you run into. Um, because what I found is that after initially starting working lean or agile in an organization, one of the problems you run into immediately is scaling. Um, and scaling to me means that it can be either more people, it could be uh, more teams, it could be different parts of the organization that are not in your department, for instance, or even if you're, if you're scaling really big, having multiple departments or maybe even multiple organizations in your value chain involved in the work you're doing. And what I found is that um, one of the things that will make or break your process is good visibility. Um, and um, I think agile portfolio management is one of the things that can help you achieve this. So what we've, what we've found and what, uh, what we see is that you run into a problem and that problem is around autonomy, entrepreneurship and alignment. Lean and Agile practices are all about enabling people to do uh, whatever they do best in order to achieve uh, good results for, for the organization and ultimately the customers of the organization. So one of the, one of the questions that managers typically have is how do I align my product owners and teams to our organizational goals and let them work in the way they want without having them to, without telling them what to do. So basically this is the question around how do I give them the freedom to work in the way they want, um, but still being able to take responsibility for the results uh, in the organization at a, at a higher hierarchical level. So if we look at lean and agile practices, there are, there are a couple things I think the solution should enable and, and should be possible uh, with, with any solution you would, you would choose. So in order to do portfolio management well and solve this problem, you need a solution that uh, enables information sharing. So we need to get the information flowing throughout the organization uh, between the people and make sure that um, everybody has the right information to, 
to make the right choices in order to move to the to our organizational uh, goals and objectives. In order for that to work, we need transparency. Um, and ultimately, whatever solution we choose should enable better discussions and better decision making. And one way to do that, or lately the way of doing it, is to create a wall and put all of the work on that. So scrum teams or, or agile teams would, would use a, a board and put all their teamwork on there. If you scale, this solution will scale with you to a certain extent. And the scaled solution of a, uh, a scrum board or a common board um, for a team is an agile portfolio wall. And this Agile portfolio wall provides this ability to the teams and the department. It usually, it usually goes up to the department level um, for the next three to 12 months. Um, it, it contributes to uh, the, the organizational goals. So not all of the work is on there, just, just the work that contributes, contributes to, the, to the department goals. Um, and it aligns teams and uh, can be used to manage dependencies. So that might be dependencies between teams, that might be dependencies between different projects or different uh, pieces of work. They might, they might need to be done in a specific order or uh, one team needs to do something before another team can start it. And a portfolio wall can help uh, achieve this. If done right, what a Portfolio wall will do is it will break down the work and connect it all to each other from all the way from long term work. So work we might be working on for, for half a year, uh, goals we might work on for half a year, um, all the way down to the task that might take a couple of hours. So typically the way we, we would structure this and um, I know this is not entirely right but it, it gives a good picture of um, how the work um, hierarchy looks. If there's a department purpose that might take multiple years, one to three or three to five is not abnormal. Um, there are goals which have the KPIs in there that, can, that actually will allow you to measure your progress towards that purpose. And then each team in an organization or in a department will have its own purpose. So, so what's, the, what's the purpose of this, this team? Why is it here? And it will have their own goals and KPIs to measure them. And they will measure that usually at a quarterly to a yearly basis. So it's not every, it's not every week, it's not every day, but you measure about every quarter and see how the progress is. From there on, you'll see that um, work will break down in, in whatever terms you might choose for this, uh, but it, um, well known are the epic features, user stories, and tasks used by Scrum teams. So if you then start looking from the task perspective and start asking why, it should roll all the way up to the organizational uh, goals and the department purpose. So if there, if there are tasks on a board or tasks on a portfolio and you ask, why is this here? And after asking a couple times why, you, you don't end up with the department purpose, there's a, there's a good um, reason to ask why it's actually on that board and why people are actually working on it. Because it might not contribute to the goals you would like it to contribute to. So the other way, the other way it really helps is by doing this, um, managers and, and project leaders, portfolio managers, will have the ability to delegate a lot of the decision making down to the teams. Um, so it's very easy to move control down um, the, the hierarchical chain and, and predictability and um, transparency on what's going on and when it will be finished will automatically go up to back to their level um, because everybody's working on the same priorities. All right, so looking at what a portfolio wall looks like, it's, um, to be honest, a messy thing. So um, this, is, this is probably what um, post-its and, and brown paper will, will always uh, yield in the end. And I'll show you a cleaner example after this slide, but 
to give you uh, to give you a picture of what it looks like, um, it's a large wall. There's a lot of information on it, and as you can probably already uh, see from from the way this is structured, people need to be there to see what information's on it. So here's a here's a little bit cleaner one, uh, straighter lines, cleaner background. And what you see is on the vertical axis on the left, you'll see the teams or the organizational goals. And depending where you are in your agile journey, you might, you might actually already have just the organizational goals and not even track work on a team, uh, team level. Um, but a lot of organizations don't start out there. So they start out by uh, putting all the teams below each other and then listing all the work they're doing uh, on, the, on the horizontal uh, swim lanes. That's the horizontal or the columns uh, on the board represent time. So typically what I do is I create a board that has a couple months in there, usually three months, and then goes up in granularity. So it'll be three months, then two quarters, and maybe half a year. That will give you a lot of a lot of insight into what work will be coming towards the department in the next 12, 12 to 14 months um, while still being sensitive to the fact that you don't know everything about the future so work might vary it might change a bit um, and it might actually change a bit in size what you uh, let me just Open this. So what so what happens um, what happens every two weeks is a portfolio marketplace, and this this is where this is where people gather um, around around the portfolio wall, uh, product owners to discuss what's going on, team members that might be interested, and any stakeholder in an organization that wants to see what's going on in a department. And in the portfolio marketplace meeting, what will happen is that. Uh, the product owner and the management of a department, or maybe chief product owners, will discuss three topics. One of them is outcomes. Um, what are we trying to achieve? Has our, have our goals or KPIs changed since the last time we saw each other? Um, and are we still on the right track, or do we need to adjust? Second topic is output. Is Are we doing the right things to achieve these goals? Um, and they, we've been working on it for a couple more weeks. Maybe, maybe we learned something about the work we're doing and it might not be the right thing to do to achieve our goals. So we might need to change um, and maybe we need to speed up. Maybe we, we've seen that a competitor is, is passing us, is releasing something faster than we'd expect it to. Um, so let's see if we're doing the right things at the right speed. The third topic is around sourcing, and sourcing um, means maybe um, we need help. So maybe the teams that are currently working on it um, are not fast enough or don't have the capability to deliver in the time we need them to. So maybe we should have other teams help out, um, maybe move some work around in order for everybody in the organization to collaborate to get our results. So this is, this is something, this is a process that will take some time to implement and some time to get used to. Um, but this, this, should, this should work for you if you have an organization that is um, mostly co-located and where you can, you can get a, a good amount of people in the same room. To give you an idea, um, it's not unusual to run a portfolio marketplace with up to 30 product owners um, and management. So that's 30 people in a room talking for two hours, discussing priorities, sourcing, uh, everything around that. So as you might expect, time can be short. Um, it'll take some getting used to um, the short time box you have here um, and the topics you need to cover and the stuff you don't need to cover. Because as you saw, there's a lot of information on a portfolio. Wall. So it's hard enough to do this when you're all together and you're all in the same location. But what if you're not co-located? That's, that's when it immediately, immediately gets more complicated. Um, one other thing is how can you 
quickly report? Um, how do you gather data on how you're doing? I will tell you from my own personal experience, it is actually possible to track all of the information in an Excel sheet uh, and make a really nice report of that. Um, when I started out as, a, as an Agile coach, uh, one of my uh, uh, Agile coaches uh, made me do that. He said, well, it's a good learning opportunity and we need data anyway. I would not recommend anybody doing it because it's so much work. So gathering data from a, from a paper wall is really hard, especially if after six weeks you find out that you actually needed a different type of information. And the other, the other thing um, that, might be, uh, that might be hard to track is what about all the other work? So there's not, there's not much work on this wall that is um, not contributing to department goals. But as you, as you all know, in, in reality, teams work on a lot of different things. They prepare stuff. Um, they come up with new ideas that they want to think about. They want to brainstorm on a bit. So capacity might be leaking away without you actually seeing it on a portfolio, wall, which is fine. But you might want to track it anyway. So um, what we do, what we do in LeanKit, the first one, and that's an easy one. All of this stuff you're doing just generates data, data, data. So you can run reports. You can you can actually get a good overview of what what's going on. Mine the information across teams, across programs, across portfolio levels. It makes it makes the world so much better for people like me who are who are gathering all that data by hand. Just tracking it. That's so. That's the simple one. Another another advantage that you have is when you start moving to a tool like this, um, is that you get a real life status of what's going on. So what I found is, and I, I'm I'm a big fan of starting out with post-its in a physical wall because it gets you much better used to the the flow and the frequency and uh, the meetings and the collaboration that you need in order to get um, to get the right mindset embedded in your organization um, because everybody needs to show up. There's peer pressure if they don't. Uh, and that's, that's a lot harder if you, if you are not co-located. But sometimes you just kind of you have to work with what you got. And that might be six different countries and 12 different locations. So um, getting everybody in the same room at the same time um, is very expensive and very ineffective. The other thing is that even if you are co-located, what will happen is that um, people will only update this wall like once every two weeks. I can I can sugarcoat this, but in what what I what I've seen is that very little product owners will update a portfolio wall in between the portfolio marketplace meetings. So we'll have a wall that um, basically shows us the wrong status for most of the two weeks and then all of a sudden it's up to date for an hour and a half and then the status changes again. So having a digital tool will allow you to track that track that data in real time because what it does, it shows you the 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 boards and the connections and dependencies that there are between different teams in real time. So what I really like about LinkedIn is the connections feature that will allow you to create hierarchies between the work you're doing. So the, the hierarchy I showed you earlier with the department goals and the department objectives and the team objectives and team goals and epic features user stories, you can actually recreate that in digital boards so that all of the information that is most valuable for the, for the people leading uh, and that might be in the team, but it might also be in a completely different department, might be in a completely different program. They have all of the information they need because it's updated in, in real life. So that's something that you will, you will really struggle with if you're doing that on a physical wall. So if you're scaling, one of the things you'll immediately run into is that you'll, you'll, need a, you'll need a solution like this. But this will only allow you to scale 
within your within your same department and within your within your same tool. And with that, I want to hand it over to Trevor, who will take you through the next part of this presentation. Thank you very much, Jesper. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. And um, so at this point, uh, much like Jesper started off, I'd like to start off with a poll here to talk about how many tools are in your uh, in your software value stream system. So you are know, using one to two. You know, is it is it growing? Are you at the you know eight plus of tools um, going from planning to implementation? Um, ITSM help desk, uh, QA, all of those various tools that you use uh, that help you develop your software. All right, so we have a, a, a decent distribution here. So um, looks like it's not wildly off from um, what we had before. What I do find is interesting, though, is that the people who uh, you know the the people who are using eight plus tools. Uh, is up at that 12%. I wonder how that correlates to the people who feel like they've achieved uh, uh, scaled agile success. Um, but with that, um, I'll go ahead and uh, continue on. So, um, all right. So let's take a step back real quick and, and readdress the why of Lean Kit. And it makes sense why I'm talking about this. But remember, at a theoretical level, all you needed was sticky notes. Um, but at some point, it was obvious that you outgrew that system. So again, LeanKit provides you know, instant sharing. So when I make an update, you see it at your desk, regardless of where you are, and you don't have to walk down the hall to see sticky notes. The transparency, I get to see what you're doing, and you get to see what I'm doing uh, in near real time. And then also, it helps make decisions without actually needing everybody in the same room. Um, you can con converse on the artifacts, uh, and it helps you make more timely and informed decisions. And so Jesper talked about growing uh, your team, but what happens when you grow, you know, and he talked about growing beyond a single location or have too many people to fit in a single room. But at this point, we're talking about what happens when you scale uh, to different types of teams, different departments. Um, and at this point, we're talking about organizations that have, you know, significant, not only a significant engineering team, but perhaps even a separate QA team, uh, a big product team, IT help desk, um, a PMO office, uh, and many of you are likely already at this point. And so just as your process and tools had to evolve when you grew um, from you know, a small team to a, a team that needed a tool like LeanKit, now the process has to evolve to take into consideration a myriad of other factors. And so now you have different departments with different needs, uh, and they have different uh, requirements that LeanKit can't solve, and, and the link kit was not built for, right? And that's and that's not a problem. So then the question begs the question: Why not look for a single tool that can solve all your problems, right? If, if you can't find the one, let's go let's go make that. Uh, and so to steal a cartoon from a Random Monroe of XKCD fame, you can see an example here of how the idea of tools proliferate. You know, stealing the idea of standard proliferations, but we'll start with you know some number of tools. And then somebody gets the, the, the brilliant idea to let's go build a one-size-fits-all solution. And at the end of the day, we just end up with one more tool. And, and, and that wouldn't be so bad, um, but that's not the worst of it. The real problem is that the tool you end up building does everything poorly and doesn't satisfy anybody. And so you know, this is a somewhat contrived uh, picture here, an example, but... You can imagine that while this thing might demo great, or you can somebody can tell, sell you this thing and tell you it can do everything in the world, imagine trying to use it. You, I could not imagine trying to cut something with this. It has a, for, it even has a pair of nail clippers uh, on the top there. If you can imagine trying to use this thing, it wouldn't work at all. And, and so you can see how the idea of some you know, panacea, some tool that works and does everything for everybody. Uh, there, you know, once you put that together and see it in action, it's it's actually worthless. So if this isn't the answer uh, to helping you scale your agile success, then then what is? And I propose something like this to continue this analogy, is that this is a much better solution. You pick the right tool that fits your needs, and then you find something that holds all of those things together. And so here you have a wrench, a tape measure, a claw, screwdriver, whatever you have, that all those things that you need to get the job done. And those things are held together in, in one sort of uh, unified fashion with a toolbox. This gives you the opportunity to use the right tool for the right job 
It gives you the chance, if you find another tool you need that you didn't before, you can very simply add that to your toolbox and take it with you wherever you need to go. If you need to switch something out, that's not a problem. And again, if this analogy uh, isn't completely clear, right, TaskTop is the toolbox, allowing you to combine all of the different uh, best of breed tools, and, and LeanKit and the other you know, agile tools or testing tools are the wrench, the screwdrivers, uh, etc. inside. So taking this uh, away from analogy into a bit of more real world example, let's take a look at, at a company here, of a company doing just the same thing. So this company has four tools in their ecosystem. They've got CAPPM for high level portfolio management, ServiceNow for their ITSM help tickets, LeanKit for prioritization, feature definition and execution, and, and HP ALM for test management. So each of these tools has their own specialty. But how does this organization keep all their teams aligned and provide the appropriate level of informational sharing, transparency, and help facilitate better decisions? The key is automated communication. And remember, going back to what Jasper was saying about LeanKit, that's the advantage that LeanKit has over sticky notes. It's that automatic communication flow between people in dislocated uh, uh, geographies. And it's automatic communication over time and space and across different people and offices and departments. And so with that being said, what needs to be communicated across teams and departments? And a lot of times you get, you, know, you come to a webinar like this and you get caught up in these high ideals and, and philosophies, but I'd like to give you some concrete takeaways that you can use regardless of which tools you're using. And again, um, regardless of which strategies you're using uh, to communicate uh, across teams. So this is some of the generic information that very likely needs to be shared to be, to be between departments, teams, and tools. Uh, it's not all inclusive. Your organization is likely going to have additional things, but this is a very uh, a good start. <clears throat> and again, think about this too. A lot of this is the same information that you get from just using LeanKit by itself. Uh, you need to have you know, status, description, summary, et cetera, uh, of, the, of the cards and issues in LeanKit but this information needs to be shared across teams. So again, status is very often the most important piece of information to pass back and forth. Um, it's the state of the defect, the story, the requirement, initiative, what have you. Uh, it, it's what you really need to know. The QA, if they file the defect and sent it to LeanKit, they need to know, is that defect, uh, what the state of it is? Is it fixed and ready for testing again? Uh, the PMO office wants to know the state of uh, the initiatives they've, they've, uh, they're implementing. Uh, then going on, you have description and summary, and these give obviously the context around whatever it is so that, that both sides of a conversation know what they're talking about, what, it, you know, what is it that's being worked on. This cross-tool traceability is an interesting one. So if you've got artifacts in, in different tools, it's very useful to know when I'm in one tool, where physically in the other tool uh, is it? So if I have, a, a, again, going to a ITSM help ticket, if, if the ServiceNow uh, help desk rep sent an, an issue over to LeanKit, it's very useful for them to be able to tell the developer in LeanKit, this is the ID of the thing in LeanKit. Or it's very often helpful to be able to click on a URL from within one tool, have that open up the location of the artifact in the other tool itself. Uh, it just speeds that, that communication to make sure that, we're, that everybody is, is conversing about the right thing uh, on the same page. Um, filtering is, is an important thing when you start talking about managing artifact flow across tools. Should something actually belong in both sides? So again, the ServiceNow scenario, not every uh, ticket that's filed in ServiceNow needs to go to LeanKit, for example. Uh, many of them don't, but if it's truly a defect that's getting uh, submitted, that does. And so it's really useful to know, I only should send the things that are marked as a defect um, from ServiceNow over to LeanKit for, for uh, work. Routing is helping you figure out how things should match up between uh, which containers they should flow to between tools, so which board does something go to on, on LeanKit, uh, which project uh, or folder should you route something to in uh, HPLM, for example. And then comments and attachments. So they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, if you have a defect, it's very useful to be able to attach a screenshot uh, inside of your HP ALM tool 
uh, on that defect and have that attachment show up in LeanKit so that the developer can see at a, at a glance, ah, this, uh, I, I understand what's going on now and now I've got a better way to fix it. So what does this thing look like in real life, right? So this is what it looks like in, in Task.Up Integration Hub. You get to see your various tools working together as a unified whole. Um, and here we have, in this example that I talked about before, we have uh, you know, initiatives in CAPPM and their lower level tool, the, the lower level tasks flow from CAPPM to LeanKit as epics. Developers in LeanKit can break these down into stories, which then flow to HPALM, where the testers can test those if they find defects that can flow back to LeanKit. And then also uh, ServiceNow Help Desk can send tickets, whether enhancement requests, uh, defects, etc., can flow to LeanKit as well. So each of these integrations has its own set of rules for what participates, what gets updated, etc. And so let's drill into this specific integration right here and, and see how you, we could, what that looks like from a configuration standpoint. So this is what it looks like, again, in Test Up Integration Hub. You can see the various levers uh, that we, we have here. So there's uh, here at the top, the create artifact you know, creation flow. So this decides how do artifacts get created? Is it one way only from uh, ServiceNow to LeanKit or can things from LeanKit get created and sent over to ServiceNow? Uh, again, it, the, it depends upon your, uh, your use case as to what you need, but it's very easily configurable. Then we'd have configure field flow beneath that. Again, we talked about that before. The configure field flow is the summary, status, description. Uh, there's a whole slew of other things, other fields that you might have for your specific, uh, your specific integration. Uh, you can configure that as well. We talked about routing. Does it go from a one-to-one -one project or does it depend on the artifact in question where um, one artifact might you know, go to one project, one might go to the other. Um, filters. So, uh, is the only high priority things flow? Is only things that are created after a certain date? Only when a certain checkbox is checked? Again, all configurable up to you in your organization. And then again, comments and attachments are simply uh, enabled via a checkbox. So again, not to drill into any of these too deeply, but you can see there's a lot of things that you must think about when you're setting up an integration and you have the same sort of um, uh, configuration details for each of those integrations uh, I, I showed on you know, the integration landscape a moment ago. So the communication information I gave earlier is very generic. Those fields that I said are, are important to deal with. And, and your organization is unique and has unique information, and that's very much expected. And the cross-team communication that we talk about first relies about an agreement on what needs to be communicated. That conversation, that discussion will cause processes to change. It's going to bring to light inefficiencies across your organization and it may be a big challenge, but uh, I, I promise you it will work and it will yield dividends. And the key to this is to not start with a full integration scenario with you know the four different tools and teams as I showed earlier. And the key here is just to start small with a couple themes and let these successes be a guide and let that success snowball. If you attempt to try to boil the ocean all at once, you'll get bogged down in an unsolvable Gordian knot and the, your attempts to scale your agile uh, processes can you know, very well may fail. And you know, there's the old adage, the, the, the way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time and we recommend that that's the process you use to building out your, your you know, and how you should scale. So. I showed you one example using four tools and, and, and the different teams, and I'd like to you know, show a couple of other scenarios that we have uh, encountered as well. So you can see here, this is a much bigger, uglier uh, integration scenario with a lot of different tools running. Um, again, this one, oddly enough, it uh, it's a little bit simpler, but for some reason brings to mind a duck's head. I don't know why, but um, this is within the TASTOP integration tool as well. Uh, again, the whole purpose of this is just to show that while your individual integration scenario and, and agile success is, is unique, there's a variety of ways uh, to implement this and, and no one is right and no one is wrong, but you have to figure out what works in your organization. 
Uh, some of these can be as many as just two tools flowing uh, one artifact type back and forth. Uh, others, as you can see here, can be huge and, and immensely complicated. So, all that being said, you know, if you take only one thing away from this webinar, it's that scaling agile success hinges on communication. So I highly recommend use the right tools to get the right information to the right people at the right time to provide the right level of control and predictability across your organization. And with that, I will open it up for questions. First question that we have is, um, how long does it take to configure one of these integrations? Good question, Laurel. Um, so, as I said earlier, the actual mechanics of setting up an integration between LeanKit and some other tool using TaskUp Integration Hub is, if you know what you want, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. That's the extent of how long it takes to click the right buttons and, and set it all up. Uh, the bigger challenge is figuring out between the team that you're on and the other team what information you want, what are the processes that you want to invoke, and what each team needs to, uh, the information each team needs to have uh, and provide to make it work in your organization. That's the piece that's that's the, the bigger challenge uh, because it's dealing with people and getting and, and communication between people, between people and teams. Um, and that takes as long as it takes for your organization to come to consensus on it. So. That's the bigger piece, but the actual mechanics of doing this is um, is a quite straightforward process. Great. And another question is, are all these integrations between cloud systems, um, cloud solutions, or can they be on-premise and cloud? Great question. Yeah, they are um, both. So um, we support uh, approximately 50 different tools, a uh, combination of, of on-premise and cloud. Uh, so, TaskUp Integration Hub is installed uh, behind your firewall so they can easily reach anything you have on-premise. Um, in addition to, it can reach out and, and talk to repositories in the cloud. Great. And then we have a, a question more towards uh, for Jasper, and that is, is, is LinkIt comparable or an alternative to uh, a Jira, would you say? Um. That's, a, that's actually a question we get quite often. Um, depends, on, depends on what your need is. So what I, what I found is that developers love Jira. Um, it, it started out as an issue tracker. It evolved, to a, it evolved to a visual management tool, and it has a lot of add-ons you can use for it. Um, therein lies the thing that I sh think people should be aware of. So. LinkIt is built for visual management. You can you can build whatever whatever visualization and whatever workflow in there that you like. So if your if your need is visualization of the work that's on your board, um, just pick any of the two. If you go beyond that and you want more advanced uh, data tracking, you want um, a better a better to me much better working. A uh, hierarchy of work, stuff like that, and you don't want you don't want to work with all types of add-ons. Then link it link it for me is the better fit. Um, that being said, we we'd like to we'd like to get in touch. If you if you have the question, just get in touch with us, and we'll be we'll be honest enough to tell you that Jira is better for you if we actually think it is. Um, so, but I I think that um, on the surface you can achieve. You can achieve a lot of similar results with them, but as you go into in, in, into it deeper, you get a deeper need, and you, you want more from from it. Um, you actually need to look into both tools much better uh, in order to see which one will fit your need best, because it, there therein is it, it is really different uh, in the end. Awesome, and then. Uh, next question we have is be uh, what is the relationship between portfolio management guidelines um, presented and scaled agile framework? Um, there isn't there isn't that much relationship in it um, other than that what we see is that a lot of agile methods borrow from each other so um, obviously um, 
task hierarchies like epics features user stories will will come back into um, into safe as well um, another another thing is that this works within safe or outside of safe so whether you're using um, the scale that your framework or you're just starting to look at what scaling method would work for you um, one link it support bo supports both we got we got template boards for for all of the safe levels if you want them um, but um, the ideas behind the material I presented will will work in both safe and in ad any other agile method or lean method you, you choose so um, it, it's it's all part of the same family um, so in, in, in that sense, it's related, but there are some differences in it uh, depending on what your context might be. You might not, you might not need everything that SAFE uh, offers you in order to get the results that you can get with the material I presented. Yeah, and, and to piggyback on that, so if you have an organization that's using a tool like CAPPM, for example, <clears throat> chances are you didn't just adopt that in the last six months, whereas it might be that you've adopted it, you know, your, your development teams have adopted a tool like uh, LeanKit or JIRA or something like that much more recently. And so the idea of, of converting you know, your PMO office uh, into a tool like LeanKit might be a bit of a challenge. So again, this is a way to sort of allow your teams to use the tool they care about uh, and it works best for them but still have that communication flow um, even if it takes a while for your your organization to uh, to fully shift to something like agile yeah well, I can I can add something to that that actually might that might help a little bit so one of the one of the we talked we talked we both talked about uh, one-size-fits-all solutions and one-size-fits-all tooling if you're transitioning to something like SAFE, um, using LinkIt and TaskTop in the way that we present it might actually get you started much faster than if you would get a tool that supports everything. So if you're growing SAFE in your organization, connecting all of your different um, applications that are used and systems that are used by different departments through uh, TaskTop will actually enable you to scale much faster than you would if you don't. Great. And um, based on a past question, can you talk a little bit more, um, either Jasper or Trevor, about the common link kit to, um, to JIRA integration use cases that you see? Yeah, so uh, I can jump on here. So, you know, you can use lean kit um, to, to be at a somewhat of a higher level than, uh, than JIRA, for example. So um, you've got higher level um, you know, projects uh, and and features and epic levels um, issues in lean kit uh, for you know a product manager for example to prioritize and rank and and work on those <clears throat> to figure out sort of what should happen uh, on a release by release level on a go forward basis for your long term planning and then only when you know at the beginning of that release to send over the right information to Jira for the developers to execute on. That's that's one scenario that um, we find being quite useful. So you can use the different boards and lean kits um, uh, to prioritize in different fashions. And then when it comes time, you can send over uh, the right uh, features over to Jira. Those could show up in Jira as an epic, for example. Uh, and then the developers can break those into stories. And then the status of those uh, epics in Jira can flow up to lean kit uh, so that the product owner can see the status of all the development that's going on. So, Jasper, I don't know if you've seen other uh, scenarios in that, but that's one I can think uh, yeah. of. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's one that came to mind uh, instantly with me. Another one is that um, in a lot of organizations you'll see, um, we're talking a lot of software, but you'll see it outside of software as well. Um, you'll see, like, scrum type work so very predictable two-week iterations um, in some teams and then more flow based work um, uh, that usually goes through a Kanban team um, and we get a lot of questions from from people saying well Jira doesn't enable us to do Kanban in the way we'd like it to do or any of the add-ons uh, but we do want to collaborate with teams that work in sprints so we see integrations where some teams in the organization 
use uh, LinkedIn and others use Jira and uh, then it, like you said it usually rolls up uh, to, a, to a, a portfolio type or program type level uh, in LinkedIn uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, and th so there's that one, and then there's the one where Jira is used in software departments, software dev departments, or, or software operations departments, and um, uh, business operations, or uh, uh, like HR type um, departments use LinkedIn, and then it, it integrates, usually through Tastom. So that, that's what I can come up with. Yeah, great. Thank you. Great. So another question we have is, does a person who's building it have to know the database connection information, such as table names, columns? <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. No, that's fantastic. No, no absolutely 100% not. Um, the way that uh, when, when TASOP uh, goes and, and uses the, the APIs of different tools, uh, and the fields and the information that's presented to the, the TASTOP administrator, the person who's configuring these integrations, is presented in clear text um, as, it, as the fields appear in the end tools. So it'll say, uh, you know, I, I want to pick the, uh, the defects in uh, HP ALM, and I, I see I've got the various field names, and they're going to be human readable, uh, and in no way, shape, or form are you having to go and figure out the... Uh, the database tables or anything of that nature. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time and effort to make it as, as simple as possible for the uh, the end user to, to integrate tools. Great. And so from one more person, we got a question around, um, they work for a five division company with various product lines and they're wondering if you think that the system presented would work for them. If the system presented, um, asking for a little more clarity, the specific one that I presented here, or um, could uh, an integration solution help them out? Um, and the reason I ask is because you know, the, the one I presented here showing Lean Kit, CA, PPM, HP ALM, and ServiceNow was, was just one example of how this can work. So if you're talking, if you've got five different uh, departments using five different tools uh, and you're having to do manual entry or sending email, emails and spreadsheets back and forth, updating on status um, and to facilitate conversations, then yes, I definitely think that you can utilize TaskTop or some, you know, some integration solutions definitely seems to be uh, useful for you um, and we'd love to be, you know, see if we can help you out with that. Great. And we have someone that's um, asking how to integrate Jira and LeanKit because they were using Jira before and they're moving on to LeanKit currently um, and how they can retain their information used in Jira um, to LeanKit. Uh, yeah, contact us or contact uh, LeanKit and uh, we can give you a, a POC and, and show you how to make it work. One thing I will note is that TASTOP is not a is not a migration tool. So if it's just a true, I want to migrate all my data, push a button and have it all flow from uh, one tool to the other and then never have the two things talk to each other again. That's, you know, TASTOP is probably not the best answer for you. But if it's, you know, a slow rollout where your organization will be using the two tools in parallel for some, you know, indeterminate time, then yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I would just contact us and get a, a uh, POC set up and we can show you how straightforward it is to uh, to make things talk together. Great. And then I think we have time for about one more question um, and that is, is LeanKit suitable for teams using Scrum? Uh, if you could talk a little bit more about that, Jasper. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, it is. So, so the 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 idea behind LinkedIn is that you can model any uh, any process you're following. Um, so the so for Scrum teams, it works. Yes, um, it just depends a little bit on what what kind of extra things you want. If you want to, if you want an automatic trigger that opens and closes a sprint, you can actually do that. Um, but 
it's not something that Linkit makes really easy for you. Um, what I, what I see is that we have actually we have actually quite a lot of teams doing Scrum using uh, using Linkit um, because it allows you to account for a lot of things that um, that make Scrum hard stuff like um, work that is unplannable uh, stuff that's coming in all of a sudden but you still want to visualize it in the same uh, in, a, in in one place so something that um, that uh, drew me, fraud, that pulled me towards LinkedIn in the in the uh, in the beginning was that um, you can actually visualize different workflows and different process flows in one place, and that uh, enables. Like I, I talked about transparency, information uh, sharing, looking at the same picture with everybody. This is something that um, I feel a lot of Scrum teams are lacking because they plan a sprint. But a lot of work that they're doing is actually not in the sprint. So if you if you are in a Scrum team, um, you can definitely use Linkit to get this visibility, and I would highly recommend it. Um, and maybe if you find a different way than doing it in Linkit, uh, please do so anyway, because getting that visibility will give you a, a giant leap forwards in your predictability and uh, transparency towards your organization. Um, but uh, the short answer, yes, uh, LinkedIn will, will help you. Awesome. Well, I think that's about all the time we have for questions. If we did not get to answer yours today, we will be sure to follow up accordingly. If you are interested in learning more about TaskTop, you can visit us at TaskTop.com or on October 4th in Columbus, Ohio. We're actually hosting our first conference, TaskTop Connect. We're going to have speakers from Nationwide, Lockheed Martin, TIAA, McKesson, and a keynote from Gene Kim talking about you know, their Agile and DevOps transformation journeys. Um, and you can find more information about TaskTop Connect at connect.tasktop.com. And thank you again so much to Jasper and our partner, LeanKit, uh, for co-presenting with us today. If you're interested in learning more um, about LeanKit you, or requesting a free trial, you can do so at leankit.com. Uh, thank you again, Trevor and Jasper, and thank you all for attending our webinar today.